This episode of the Course Grind Podcast has been brought to you by Central Sports and Graphics Incorporated, family-owned and operated screen printing and embroidery business located in a historic storefront on Old Berwick Road in the heart of SB. They've been doing screen printing for over 20 years. They have high-quality product at a low price. Be sure to check them out. Central Sports and Graphics Incorporated, 570-784-1212. Now, on to the show. Hi, this is Chef Rick Moonen. We're listening to Sean Rossler on Course Grind. Come and listen in. Get a few tips. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Episode number 180 of the Course Grind podcast. With you as always this evening, host creator Sean Rossler. How is everyone doing tonight you know i'm heading past the midway point of my seventh year behind this mic and it's safe to say i've done a lot i've talked to the local hangout i've talked to the michelin star or beard nominee from a thousand miles away hell i've talked with some youtube celebs from ireland and yet the best thing about it all is that it keeps me coming back with topics i might not have ever considered places i've never been or better still people who i never thought i'd have the opportunity to talk to despite being held in profound reverence. Well, thanks to this show and the friendships I've forged from it, I have the opportunity to sit down to share the story of someone who I consider to be nothing short of culinary treasure in our area for our university, for Bloomsburg itself. A story I thought I'd never get to share, yet here we are, and I am humbled. Tonight's guest's very name is synonymous with fine dining in 17815. If you ask anyone, and I mean anyone, who attended Bloomsburg University in the 80s, the 90s, the early aughts, this was the place to be. The menu, the beautiful thick menu that hearkened to literally pleasing whatever possible need you could have culinarily. For me, it was always the Monte Cristo along with the three soups. Shrimp bisque being the absolute zenith. My wife, of course, she chose the Kennedy's potato. The menu was then gloriously and unceremoniously rivaled by the beer menu that carried quite literally whatever profile you could possibly desire and came from literally all over the state. It's actually how I became familiar with a little place called Shangy's. I digress. Did I mention the 100 Club? 100 different beers, you got your name on the board, and while I didn't attain such greatness, I still have quite literally my card framed here in the studio. The food, the drink, the atmosphere, all anchored by its namesake and kept running in ship shape by his lovely wife, but she's a whole other fabulous topic. Hell, it's the place I proposed to my wife, so you understand where I hold this place and this guy. If you're from the area, you already know where I'm talking about. If you're not, you should start feeling a sense of pain now that you never got to experience it. Truly one of the all-time greats, full stop, and it's my honor, privilege, and pleasure to bring him on, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone in between, local culinary icon, Epicurean legend, and the man synonymous with fine dining in Bloomsburg, the Russell Lewis. Russell Lewis, welcome to the podcast, sir. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, Sean. It is an absolute honor, an absolute pleasure, um, and privilege. Um, and already we were riffing before we turned the mics on, and we also have music in common so i think we're gonna have to jam someday maybe maybe we come out with a new title track for the podcast but that's neither here nor there um we're here to talk about you sir and everything you did for this area um from from a culinary standpoint folks who are new to the program folks who have terrible short-term memories like yours truly starters mains and afters we're going to talk about first and starters where the guest in question came from what brought them to what they did mains what they've been doing, and finally afters, a little bit more irreverent, a little bit more off the cuff, but I promise you no one has been profoundly physically injured in 179 episodes, so I don't see it happening tonight. So without further ado, I can't believe I'm actually saying this name and I'm talking to this guy. Without further ado, Russell Lewis. We we know you, and I say we, I say a collective Bloomsburg we. We know you because of Russell's, but I'm dying to dive into the backstory. So can you tell us all a little bit, a little bit about rather, where and what you grew up eating? Ah, uh, well, um, kind of a sad story to begin with. Uh, my father left when I was about eleven years old. 
mm-hmm. um, which left my mother in a very precarious position. Uh, so I had to go work in a restaurant mm-hmm. and wash dishes at Coach, which you probably didn't remember because I think it was the early 70s. Mm-hmm. And I worked there for two years. Okay. Uh, then I moved on to uh, Hotel McGee all through my junior high school and high school. We remember the McGee for sure. Yes. Uh, I-, I can remember uh, working with uh, Rudolph Standish. Um, the omelet king of the world at the time, in the uh, late 60s. We nice. cooked uh, omelets for 2,000 people at a uh, New Year's Eve celebration for Governor Scranton. Wow. Uh, I can remember cutting uh, prime rib with uh, one of my other workmates, who's now passed away, Danny Miller, mm-hmm. and car- carving up prime rib for 550 people down in Lewisburg. Unbelievable. Uh, and. Uh, from there, I went to uh, the. Mm-hmm. I was a. I had a scholarship to go for management mm-hmm. uh, from the Statler Foundation, and uh, I gave it up after two semesters because I didn't think I wanted to work in the restaurant business. And I became a uh, philosophy and chemistry major at Penn State. Wow, that's. I mean, that's that's quite and a that's quite a turnaround. It's, it was. <laughs> uh, and after uh, five and a half years of working. Uh, at my studies, which uh, I, I could have continued for another 10 years, but uh, I was just married, uh, mm-hmm. I think it was in 1977, and uh, to Maria, and uh, we had to start thinking about starting our life, Yeah, and uh, she, we came back in a little French soup kitchen in State College, and then uh, we came back to Bloomsburg, and I was managing to start off with, mm-hmm. and... Uh, there we uh, decided to buy uh, a restaurant decided to buy a restaurant and so like the landscape for you you know i i think so many people think of like opening a restaurant as this like you know kind of chic thing to do now it's it's trendy and everything that then it wasn't like you had to have that passion and you know i hear you talking about like literally from 12 working in a restaurant so of course that's in your blood um Yes, and it was. you know this the the the, the, the soup kitchen action down in state state college you come back here and obviously uh, again it's it, it's kind of like telling a story but we all know the ending cuz we all know russells like we all from and when i say we all and god i i want to let you just talk endlessly but i have to express to you when you say bloomsburg university Everyone says Russell's. Everyone knew it. So talk to me about like the the origin story because your menu your menu was ungoddamn paralleled and I loved its complexity. It was so beautiful. You literally could tuck in with that, you know, to go to sleep for the night and read it like a book. It was wonderful. How did Russell's conceptualize? How did it begin and how did it evolve? Uh well it- Again, simply uh, because I, I knew what the market was in the area. Mm-hmm. Um, I had seen what my competitors were doing, and they were leaving a gap mm-hmm. with uh, number one. But actually, for just the everyday um, worker, mm-hmm. I want to spend, and this was in the uh, early 80s, $20 for dinner. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, I just a little menu that... Uh, I thought would work for the area in the first year. It was very tough, mm-hmm. uh, but things kept on growing. And the more I learned about cooking and restaurants and uh, after going to a lot of restaurants, both in New York and Philadelphia and Chicago, um, I started to get a feel of what Russell's wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so to... <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. Sorry. From, from those travels then, was that where, because I've, I've always wondered, I've always wondered, you know, for such a varied menu, the inspiration had to have come from just a, a, a gaggle of locations that you went to. And were, were you kind of like picking almost a la carte these locations, like, I'm going to bring that, put it on the menu? How, how did that happen? Uh, well, exactly just like that. I, I'd go <laughs> on to eat someplace and go, boy, I'd like to bring that back to Bonesburg. Uh. And uh, also, I had uh, a collection of 450 cookbooks. Uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I tried to get as many experiences as I could. 
Um, I met a lot of wonderful people yeah. in the food business. Um, Jean-Louis Paladin mm. from down in Washington, D.C. Absolutely. Uh, George Currier wow. um, from the Beckton in Philadelphia. Um, the owners up at uh, the Finger Lakes, uh, mm. which was Paul Geis. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just tried to talk to as many restaurateurs as possible. And always remembering that not only can uh, you learn from books, but you learn from other people and you learn from your employees. I was just going to say, like, what a, what a smart move you did. And again, I don't think that's that's found because a lot of times restaurant equals ego, right? It's I'm going to do my uh, thing yeah. and to hell with everybody else. I'm going to do my own thing. You were smart enough to say, hey, look, these people are talented. They have knowledge that I can pick from. You know, let me borrow a little inspiration. Let me glean it. Maybe not copy it, but, you know, you you were wise enough, you know, at that early on to be like, hey, I can bring pieces of this and I can make this my own. That's that's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, that was probably one of my best strengths. Oh, man. I mean, it, because because here's here's the thing the the soups alone, the soups alone were enough to bring people back. Like week after week after week after week. And yet, you know, they weren't all, it was, um, now watch this. I have nothing in front of me. I wish, I wish there was a video feed in here so people could believe me. There's nothing in front of me, but I'm going to say shrimp and chew pig chowder, shrimp bisque, Terry's Kennedy, uh, 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 Terry's Irish potato soup. Um, shit. Was there another, was there a French onion that was on menu? Yes. Okay. French onion. And I feel like there was a fifth one because you had to pick from five. You had to pick three to get the sensational soups. I feel like I'm missing one. Help me out. Oh, boy. Uh, oh, man. If I stumped you, I'm in business. <laughs> but, uh, which uh, was written up in uh, Bon Appetit magazine. <laughs> which one was um, that, Russ? Broccoli cheese soup. Broccoli cheese. That's what it was. That's what it was. And it was in Bon Appetit. Yes. Oh my God. That's, that's amazing. You know, actually, I meant to tell you, somebody uh, texted me a picture of their uh, Russell's cookbook. And I was scrambling to see if I could go over and get it and like leaf through it and have all my recipes in a row. I obviously didn't get it because I couldn't remember that. But, you know, Bon Appetit, broccoli and cheese soup, all these soups, all these everything. Uh, again, it speaks to the fact that you were able, and it, it really speaks to your menu. You were able to take so many influence. You were fusion before fusion was cool. You know what I mean? You were you were different uh, locations before it was even a thing. Maybe not true fusion, but locale fusion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Unreal. Unreal. So, you know, this is uh, again, when you started Russell's, can can you put the pin in the year for me when Russell's opened? 1981. 1981. Talk to me about July 6th. July 6th, 19 He knows it to the day, folks. And again, why wouldn't he? Um, so July 6th, 1981, the restaurant opens, the menu opens, and the bar opens. Talk to me about what that looked like then. Uh, well, back in 81, when we first opened up, uh, the bar that you remember on the right-hand side was actually an ice cream parlor. <laughs> um, All right, now I feel bad. Did we kick kids out of an ice cream parlor? <laughs> <laughs> It was an ice cream parlor sandwich place that the uh, <laughs> the ends had for people that didn't want to drink alcohol. Oh, okay. The, the original owners. Uh, we actually had, our bar was actually in the back of the dining room. It had uh, five stools at it, and uh, that was when we opened up. That's uh, had for a bar, and after about three months, I said, "This really isn't working." Uh, we started at one o'clock in the morning, mm-hmm. raised the counter of the barn <laughs> up, raised the stools up and within, uh, two days. And then uh, the third day, I think I painted the whole room a dark, uh, blue. And, uh, that's how the bar started. Oh, and, yeah. uh, we had a lot of people from the press come in late at night. Yeah. Because we were reasonably priced, yeah. um, and it wasn't until I think around eighty five, yeah. um, 
that we started getting a big college business as far as and that was because uh, I hired a bartender um, our first college bartender was uh, Todd Tallarico uh, oh my god why why do I recognize that name Todd Tallarico Doug Pie fraternity brother that's why holy shit okay 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 and uh, because of me hiring Todd, obviously the Delta Pi fraternity came down and would start eating hat sandwiches, cups of soup and sandwiches and uh, then would stay there to drink. And so so, uh, so so that's amazing. Talk about talk about demand that was driving. My, probably my first smart move that I made in the bar. Oh man. Was hiring Todd. <laughs> that's uh, awesome. That is because awesome. once the Delta Pi fraternity showed up, then sort of the other ones, and then the sororities came. Oh, absolutely! And I mean, they were right around the corner. And you yes. know what? You you saying that about like you know half sandwiches and soups? It's making a smaller meal for the people who you know just kind of want to hang out until uh, it's time lunch, to. Well, the lunch ladies uh, love that because they didn't have to spend a lot of money, and they still got a uh, substantial lunch. Oh my God, that's incredible! So I gotta ask you, and maybe you don't know, was it Todd Tallarico who came up with the Baltimore Zoo, or was that somebody else? Uh, we did Long Island Ice Teas. I think Harry's actually came oh, up was with that, the Baltimore Zoo. Was that a Harry's? Because I remember yes. you could get them, but it was almost begrudging. So I didn't know if it was some kind of rivalry. So you did the LITs. Yeah, um, we were the first people to serve Long Island iced teas, and that was because my brother was a bartender in uh, uh, at Zorbs, okay, in uh, Nevada. Yep, and uh, he brought that back because wow. he was our first bartender that we hired in the big bar. Okay, okay. So, so when when the big bar opened, the dining room off to the left was still the dining room, right? That was the original. That's restaurant. correct. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. then, because then we have this evolution, one more room over to the left, and that was Clancy's, named after, I believe, a Shetland Sheepdog? No, uh, our or Old English Sheepdog. Old English yes. Sheepdog, sorry. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Clancy used to uh, sit on the uh, landing here as you <laughs> walked in the restaurant, and she would sit there all day, and the I mean, bartenders would feed her turkey and bacon. I love that. I love that. Um, when did, when did Clancy's, um, I- expand then? So if, if 81, you open 96. 96. Okay. Yep. That's awesome. And so what was the impetus behind that move then? Well, if we got just a little bit, um, I don't know if you remember, but we were the first restaurant to have a cafe in Bloomsburg and that came about on my 30th birthday. My wife and I, when we opened up the 20 six years old mm-hmm, mm-hmm. uh we turned 27 that month mm-hmm. 30th birthday my friend robert schwimmer brought me back 30 belgian beers oh first i, I have to you. find a place to find these things yeah yeah and uh that's when i did for changis yep and Emmaus. and uh he also brought me back these pictures of all these cap i mean belgium and uh i said Probably not. My wife said, "Of course we can," <laughs> uh, because she could sweet talk anybody. Yeah, uh, yes, uh, yes. Because uh, I don't think anybody ever turned. No, and no. Uh, we did have a rough time to be so into letting us put a cafe out there and yeah, advertisement. Uh, you camp for a restaurant mm-hmm, mm-hmm. up front. Yeah, for all those restaurants, uh, put out a cafe. <laughs> yep. Yep. And I mean, you did it. And again, the success of that, you know, looking looking at Clancy's, like isolating Clancy's, like Clancy's work. Clancy's was where we would go to after work, you know, and obviously that's not the whole like cafe vibe there. But obviously that was that was a conduit to just growth. Um, I mean, un- unbelievable. So you mentioned Shangies. I love Shangies. I love, you know. When when my in laws lived in Allentown, it was the only excuse I needed to drive over to Emmaus and and check it out. Where in the love of God, Russell, did the Hundred Club come from? Ah, I had a friend in uh, that I had met in the early eighties, mm-hmm. 
um, that was doing this shirt called uh, Beers Around the City and called the Brick Skeller. Mm-hmm. Had the largest selection of beer in the country. Wow. Uh, um, at that time, around 650 mm-hmm. different beers. And this is before beers were even all that popular yet. Yeah. Well, I mean, People that's, that's just, important. Start, they were just starting to experience uh, um, Anchor Steam. Oh, okay. Uh, and some little, and some Sierra Nevada. Yep. Yep. I mean, because that's, that's uh, an important point to make. Just like, like, Food celebrity wasn't a thing when you were opening a restaurant that really embraced food as like life. Um, you know, beer and craft beers and all this stuff. Man, I mean, this is a pretty recent. You know, I, I, I shouldn't say recent. It's recent to me because I'm getting up there. But um, well, you know, thirty years. You know, before them, uh, it was Budweiser and Miller. That's it. That's it. You had PBR and maybe um. Um, what was, well, yep, yeah, Yingling, you had Heineken and that was like frou-frou. So everyone, yes. you know, everyone felt that. And then here's you coming at us with this, Hey, by the way, drink a hundred different beers and you know, 10 of them have to be from France and or it might not have been 10 from France, but it was 10 from Germany for sure. 10 from Belgium. Um, it actually had around the world, which was 20 beers for 22 beers. And then after that, uh, we had a, the Visa Club, which was 50, and nice. then after that, it became the 100 Club. Oh, that 100 Club, like, listen, if you were in Russell's, and why the hell wouldn't you be, by the way? If you were in Russell's and you were sitting at the bar, the first thing you did was look up, and if it was your first time in, you look up and you go, what in the hell is that? And it's a list of names, and it's a list of honorable, beautiful, savage names that did the 100 Club, and I... You know, if, if, if honestly, if, if I have one life regret, man, it's that I'm looking at 73 beers on my pink card and I went, God damn it. You were so close. What happened to you? And you know, <laughs> l- l- life happens. It closed well, down. It's not cheap to drink a hundred. Hell no. Uh, that's, the, the world. <laughs> that's the thing, man. You know, when you're like, Oh yeah, drink, drink five beers from France. I'm like, shit, each one's 18 bucks. Like, yeah. But, but at the same time, and, and this, this was the beauty. But that 18 bucks was worth drinking Jen Lee. I gotta God, tell you. Yes. That's the beauty <laughs> of it. Because you yeah. took people, you did this, Russell. You took people out of their comfort zone and you made them feel and experience something that they wouldn't typically experience here in Bloomsbury. Jingu, uh, uh, Jingu or Jangu, it was the Brazilian black beer. And I had that. Um, God, it was actually one of my first other category. There was 15 lines for other, and I had it, Jingu. And I'm like, this is amazing. This is like nothing I've ever tasted before. It was a black, I'll say black lager, I might be wrong, from Brazil. And I oh, had that's this. What it was. Oh, okay, yeah. cool. I, I had this moment where I'm like, holy shit, I'm in Bloomsburg drinking black lager from Brazil, thanks to the genius of this guy. Um, you know, and I think that's where a lot of people who hold nostalgia for you and for your establishment and for everything you stood for, that's, that's what it goes back to. It's like, you didn't, you didn't necessarily like you did everything right as far as like how to fit in, but you didn't fit in a main street Bloomsburg, but you made people think like, like I, I, I do, I can do this. I can taste this. I can try this. And I've, I saw more culinary evolution of people, of their palates, of everything in your restaurant, hands down, than any I've ever sat in. Full stop. You did that. You, you know, that's, that's, that's all on you. So kudos to you for that. Again, this is the whole, Russell told me before we sat down, he's like, I'm not much for tooting my own horn. I told him I'm going to do this fully for you. Um, so, so there is that. So the hundred club. The boards on the wall, the, the the half a sandwich and soup, the trio, everything, it really created a landmark. When was it that you knew? When was it that you knew? And, you know, it could be 85 when you started with um, Todd Tallarico, the, the Delta Pi bartender. It could have been in 96 with Clancy's. When was it you stepped back and you went, this works. This is This is really good. You had to have had a moment where you felt satisfied with what you were doing. Um, I think in, it was 91 or 92 and, 
I said, okay, I want to, we did this. Uh, I want to move on and do something else. And my wife came to me and said, uh, I love this. Would you please stay and work with me? Wow. Uh, but it was, yeah, it was in 91. Wow. And, uh, wow. And, but like many, many, many more experiences after 91, obviously. Uh, yeah. We went on, went on to have, uh, oh, I'm trying to think, 1,300 different wines. We had 750 beers. Your wine, uh, cellar, your wine cellar was absolute savagery. Uh, you should know that. It was one of the most beautiful wine lists I've ever come across. And like, I'm, I'm not a small time player when it comes to that. I like my wine. Damn. I mean, your, uh, your list was on point. So, and, and 750 beers. And, and this is the thing people not in the industry don't realize what it takes to keep that stocked. You know, uh, you, yeah. you you want to keep that on the list. You so want to be with, able to say with lots of coolers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, lots Cooler and space. lots of coolers. Um, yeah, man. And I mean, I, I mean, that's it. And and you know, we know. You know, time time went on, and you know, things. You know, it be it became Russell's and Christie's twenty eleven. Twenty eleven? No, no, before 29. that. Twenty nine. Okay. We sold in 2008. Uh, yep. So I guess in 2008, it became uh, Russell's and Christie's. Yep. Different owner, uh, different idea. He was not a restaurateur. Yep. Uh, unfortunately for the town. Yeah. Uh, and had, he, he loved money rather than food. So. And you can't, you can't, and that's uh, that's honestly, uh, I, I don't want to be self-indulgent, and I don't want to just, you know, kind of placate to the guest. But I, I I mean this. I mean this when I say this. I can remember when the change happened, and I remember saying there ain't no way because there was a feeling, there was a vibe, and and I'll you know again as kind of a love letter to to your restaurant to to you personally, man. You know I I you know I came there as a wide-eyed college student in '95, and you know I found out about it, whatever, whatever, and in 2001 uh, dropped the knee. Was the one of them named Jason Butter. Ooh, that name sounds familiar. Actually, I'm not going to lie, but I would have been 18 yeah. at the time, so I might not have been in uh, to see you at that point. But um, you know, I I you know I had heard of it, and then 98 or so, I started to come in, and 2001, I dropped the knee on a sidewalk and put a ring on a girl's finger who uh, is actually not here with the three boys right now. She's down in Philly, but um, I I I remember your staff helping me do that. And then we had a rehearsal dinner there. So, you know, again, you know, I, I don't, I don't necessarily want to be like, Oh yeah. And that's how it ended. I, I really don't want it to be about that. I wanted to focus on, you know, your story, how it evolved from 1980, July 6th, 1981 to, you know, to, to when it didn't, to when it wasn't, but just tell you, like be able to tell you on air and share this message and let people hear, um, you know, what, what, a just phenomenally loved location yours was, I mean, without a doubt. And, and, and you have to know that you have to have had moments where people came to you and told you that over the years. And if they didn't, I'm going to kick all their asses collectively right now, but I have to imagine y y you knew no, pe people have been very, very kind yeah. and, uh, tell me that they was. Yeah. I mean, beyond, beyond a shadow of a doubt. And, you know, I, I have to wonder if if one or two memories stick out most to you, what are they? You know, do, do you remember any particular interactions with maybe, you know, clientele, maybe somebody just passing through? It might be early on. Uh, uh, the first one would be um, there was uh, a guy that wrote State Gourmet mm -hmm. and uh, he came in and he I'd like to have lunch. He sat down and had lunch and tasted some of our soups and uh, he had a sandwich and uh, he said, do you mind if I put your name in writing a book about a restaurant? Uh, that, that was things that go, just, uh, it just made me feel good. Yeah. That somebody liked our food. And I'm sorry, Russ, when, the, when the was other, that? That was probably two or 83. 82, 83. Nice. A couple of times we were written up in the New York Times in my life. Wow. At, uh, the New York Post wrote about us one time. June wrote us about, 
in the film. One of the great experiences I had was a socialist conference in Bloomsburg at the end. And uh, these gentlemen, somebody brought them, I think it was Tony, a prof- ex-professor, Tony Sylvester. Mm-hmm. I was standing behind the bar, shots of vodka, <laughs> with three Russians, two guys from Africa, and some other way. Mm-hmm. And just to listen to these, and they all spoke English, obviously, but sure. listen to these people be what life was like in their own country. Uh, it was a wonderful experience. And then I can also remember another time, um, say, family from France that owned a water company there. And, uh, of course, I bought them a bottle of French wine. Uh, <laughs> of course, of course. Because uh, I, I always loved meeting people from other countries also. Uh, they invited Maria to stay in an apartment that they Burgundy. Of course, Maria was in there. Mm. Yeah. But, uh, just wonderful people. Yeah. Uh, was the fun part of the, the restaurant. Well, and that's, it, it, you know, isn't that what it always comes back to? It's about seeing that smile on people's face. You know, Bourdain would say, you know, and, and, and they would say about him later in life, like he would still cook despite CNN shows and everything like that. If he cooked for you, he would literally sit apprehensively and just watch your reaction. Because I think there's a part to anybody in this field, whether it be a culinary podcast host like myself or an acclaimed restaurateur like you, you just want to see people enjoy what it is you're doing. You know, they've worked all week. Yeah. Uh, They've taken time out of their lives to spend it at your restaurant. Um, You want them to be relaxed. You want them to enjoy themselves and hopefully enjoy your food also. That's it. That's it. At the end of the day, and and I can tell you with utmost certainty, sir, that Russell's uh, went above. I can speak for every single Bloomsburg alum right now and say that you did that. You did that in spades, man. So, for, you know, as again, as a love letter to Russell's, thank you, because it's because of you that that, that happened. Um, I got some quick after questions here. Um, sure. that, that'll, we're going to lighten the mood a little bit here, kids, cause we don't normally end on such a, like a somber, you know, experience, but I've waited, I've waited a long time. I've waited at least 21, 20 years or so to have this interview. So, and it might not be all, you know, during hosting the podcast, but anyway, uh, we'll lift the mood up a little bit because I'm dying to know some things about you, sir. Um, personally, if we were cooking together, um, like I typically do in my kitchen, I'm sure you do in yours. I've got to ask you, if you had control of the radio, what are we listening to? Jazz. Nice. Now, now who? you got to go a little bit more specific than that. Miles Davis. Love it. Uh, weather Report. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, yeah. Coltrane. Oh, of Coltrane. course. Coltrane for days. Uh, I don't Mm-hmm. So, but uh, I, that, uh, and it's not to say that I don't like rock and roll or I don't like blues, but if I have my choice, first choice, it's jazz. Yep, I need I need some something that pace wise is going to keep me moving. I'm right there with you, um, for sure. Um, next question: You're going to be stranded on a deserted island, fictitious, of course, but you can only bring three foods. Or food type items with you. They can be pieces of equipment, um, you know, condiments, additives, anything like that. But you can only bring three to a deserted island. What would they be and why? Uh, peanut butter, because I'm addicted to it. Oh my god, I love that answer. You might actually be the first person in 180 episodes to say that. That's amazing. Yep. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, Washington State Cherry. I'm sorry, Washington State Cherries? Yes. Nice. There was a vendor down in Philadelphia. Uh, I can't think of his name. He used to run Finer's Produce, commercial produce stand in the commercial section of Philadelphia. Um, and he got the best cherries in the world. Wow. Right there. Nice. Uh, and what else am I bringing? Uh Spear gun. <laughs> yeah. See, that's a thinker, kids. That's a thinker. You can take your French training 
and stow it because that's a thinker right there, a spear gun. I love that answer. And that might actually be one of my favorite answers ever. Not going to lie. Um, if there was one meal that would encapsulate your perfect meal, what would it be? Oh. My own personal meal or is it something that I ate someplace? Your your own personal. If you were if you were having one meal that would be just it, what what is that meal to you? Well, my favorite thing in the world is uh, lobster. Love uh, it. A, a, a steamed lobster. Uh, I, I've had it with a. Uh, I was used to serve it in the restaurant with some with a brandy cream sauce. Love it. Uh, quite decadent, mm -hmm. uh, but boy. Is that rich? Yeah, absolutely. What What are you drinking with it? I'm probably drinking a Edgar Wurzterminer. Love, love uh, it. A little, little spice, and it'll still blend well with the whiskey. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I love that. And finally, Russell freaking Lewis. I, I can't believe I'm still talking to him. Russell Lewis, what is food to you in a single word? art and we can thank the french and the italians for that that's absolutely true absolutely true it is art and what you did what you did on plates what you did in menus what you did in a building on main street here in bloomsburg and what you did for everybody was truly art so russell lewis i cannot thank you enough for taking time out of your evening to hang out here with us and share your story with us it is truly an absolute honor well, it was kind of you to call. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been episode number 180 of the Course Grind Podcast with me this evening, the local culinary icon, Russell Lewis himself. Our producer, as always, has been the lovely, voluptuous Reverend Johnny Lamoria, a.k.a. Johnny Leland Robinson. Be sure to check out all his libertarian happenings in the 18431. The next episode will bring back, bring back rather, a familiar face. Stay tuned. Are you passing through central Pennsylvania and looking for one of the best dining experiences and craft brew menus around? Look no further. Turkey Hill Brewing Company and 991 Central Road in Bloomsburg, PA has everything you could ask for and then some. Service, food, beer, together, unbelievable. Be sure to check them out. Call them today for reservations, 570-387-8422. Call today.